Good evening and welcome everyone to our season finale. I am so excited that all of you have come out this evening as we um, host James Clapper. The World Affairs Council prides itself on bringing to Houston the right speakers at the right time, and I believe that you are going to really enjoy some of Mr. Klepper's insights, his experience, and uh, we are so excited that all of you came out tonight. I do want to take a quick moment, do some housekeeping, so everyone take a few seconds, make sure your phone is off, let's uh, be courteous this evening, and uh, I'm going to just double check mine because you never know. There we go. Okay. Um, secondly, I am so pleased that we have a full room and that uh, we are partnering with the Brazos Bookstore to bring uh, James Clapper and his book to you this evening. I want to recognize any uh, of the individuals who are in the audience with, uh, who are veterans or who are, who are in our active military. Is there anyone here tonight? Please stand. Thank you for your service. So uh, before we get started, I just want to uh, once again let you know this is our final program for this season. So it is our season finale. We are going to be taking two months, two and, two and a half months in preparation for an exciting fall. So if you are not on our mailing list, please make sure that you register at our World Affairs Council website and get on our newsletter dist distribution. You can see what we have planned for the fall. As always, we will take questions at the end, and there's blue question cards floating around. Mr. Clapper is going to be inundated with lots of questions, so if you do have a question, um, raise your hand at the end, and we'll pick those up, and we'll give them to him, and he can address those. As well as, he is going, he has graciously told us that, you have a question already? Can I move the podium? Yes, sir, I'm gonna move the podium. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, as always, if you um, can't hear at any time, please raise your hand, even if you're way in the back, and this kind gentleman over here is going to help us adjust the sound for you. And uh, without further ado, I am going to introduce our uh, conversation for the evening. Mr. James Clapper served as the fourth United States Director of National Intelligence, the U.S. top intelligence office and President Obama's senior intelligence advisor from 2010 to 2017. Beginning his career as an enlisted Marine Corps reservist, Clapper eventually became a three-star Air Force Lieutenant General and Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, retiring from uniformed service in 1995. In 2001, he returned to service, becoming the first civilian director of the National Imaging and Mapping Agency just three days after 9-11. In 2007, he was appointed the Pentagon's top intelligence official, serving as an appointee for both Bush and Obama administrations before President Obama appointed him as the Director of National Intelligence. Today, Mr. Clapper joins us to give us a privileged look inside the U.S. intelligence community and to discuss some of the most difficult challenges facing our nation. Hosting the conversation this evening is our own Director of Programs, Ronan O'Malley. He is the Director of Programs for the World Affairs Council and has an esteemed background in, in his own right. In this role, he interviewed a wide variety of notable figures, including General Stanley McChrystal, former Senate Majority Leader and U.S. Special Envoy for the Middle East, George Mitchell, former Director of the CIA and the NSA, Michael Hayden, former Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisor, Elliot Abrams, President of the Council on Foreign Relations, Richard Haas, and two of Mr. Clapper's CNN's colleagues, retired Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling and former Deputy Director of the CIA's Counterterrorism Center, Philip Mudd. Please give a warm welcome to James Clapper, Ronan O'Malley. Thank you all again very much for coming. A, a wonderful crowd for a, a, a truly incredible uh, and dedicated American who's uh, dedicated 55 years of his life uh, in various forms of service to the country. And again, I'd like to thank Brazos Bookstore for, for co-hosting this event with us. 
And uh, before we get to kind of just even your own kind of military history and military career, I thought that maybe some people might realize that this is a career that maybe perhaps you were born into. Your, your father was an was a, a intelligence officer serving in both World War II, the Korean War, and even in Vietnam, where the, the two of you had the, the I suppose, happenstance to actually have some time serving together. Um, can you maybe just tell us a little bit about your, your, your kind of life growing up back then? I mean, starting with, I think you, I remember you saying your, your youngest memory is when you were just a toddler. You were on a troop transport very shortly after World War II, pulling into Livorno, uh, a port city in southern uh, Italy, and your, your ship was struck by struck uh, an existing mine in the harbor. Yeah. <laughs> well, first, uh, it's great to be here uh, in Houston, and uh, I'm really uh, overwhelmed with the turnout here. I, I, it's uh, very humbling, and it's great to be here. Anyway, to uh, the, the question. Uh, my earliest memory, uh, I guess, I was about uh, five or six years old, and uh, my mother and I were on the first boatload of dependents that went anywhere after World War II. And my dad was uh, posted at a very small signal intelligence post on uh, eastern Africa, in, in Eritrea, uh, Asmara. And it was quite a production in those days to travel from Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, all the way out there. It took about eight weeks. We left the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard on a troop ship and uh, went to uh, Leghorn, Italy, Livorno, to pick up 500 Italian war brides. These are women that had married uh, American soldiers. And on the way in the harbor, we hit a mine and blew the rudder off the ship. And I can remember very distinctly, we were up on deck and they lowered the lifeboats. And my mother had, I had this huge life preserver on, way too big for me. It didn't have any for little kids. And she's holding on to me like this. And uh, fortunately, the crew uh, reacted, and they towed us in the harbor. And I can still remember the uh, mass of ships that were sunk during the war. And this is 1946. I wasn't that late, but uh, lots of, so you could just see them right above the water. It's almost like a cemetery with these masts that sticking out of the water. So we were laid up there for a couple weeks. They repaired the rudder, and we eventually uh, made it <coughs> to uh, Alexandria, Egypt. Landed there and uh, it put us up in the old uh, 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 this old British hotel, which has since burned down. And uh, so my parents, uh, my dad met us there, and uh, he was a first lieutenant in the army. And they sort of parked me at the top of the stairs, and this little suite area. And at the foot of the stairs was a small bar. So they went down and you know just have a, a drink, reunion drink. And it turns out this bar was frequented by King Farouk. And he was there and he started hitting on my mother. And, uh, so my dad uh, had had a drink or so and he took a swing at the king, which is not a good thing to do. And uh, my first memory then was uh, that experience was, it was about two o'clock in the morning and my mother is waking me up and uh, we're packing our bags and they got a plane for us and hustle us out about a week early to get us out of Egypt. So anyway, that was... <laughs> so maybe just to move a, a few more years on from that, that point, uh, I think perhaps a sign that your, your family knew you truly were meant oh, to be yeah. an intelligence officer. Yeah. Could you talk about your, uh, your summer in Philadelphia that was quite different to your typical 12-year-old? Well, first of all, just to make sure everybody knows uh, what my dad was doing. He was a signal intelligence officer, which is uh, during World War II, a collection of Japanese and uh, German messages and then converting them into uh, intelligence. And most everybody, of course, after the war ended, everybody demobilized. Most people got out of the, uh, out of the military, took their uniform off and went home. But he was captured by this mission and he just, he, he stayed with it. And, uh, uh, and so uh, what was referred to here was when we were, we were in Japan in the early 50s, uh, 1951, 52 or so, and we came back to the States. My dad was reassigned to, from northern Japan to Fort Devens, Massachusetts. So typical in military families, at least ours, my parents would park my sister and me at one of the grandparents. They'd go off to the next duty station and uh, get settled, and then they'd be, retrieve us. So that's what happened in the summer of 1953. I was 12 years old. You can do the math. 
<laughs> and my parents parked me at my grandparents' house in Philadelphia. And the big novelty of the day was television. We didn't have television in Japan in 1951 and 52. But my grandparents had this huge television set, black and white, of course. And they do what I'm doing now as a grandparent. They spoil the grandkids. So I got to stay up as late as I wanted and watch TV every night. It was great. So one of the first Friday nights I was there and I watched, watched a movie and it went off about 12.30 in the morning. And so I, I thought I'd surf. Well, in those days, you actually had to walk up you know, to the TV and turn the dial. Uh, I, I see many in this crowd understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, so I was turning the channel between channel four and five, and I heard this talking. No picture, talking. And I just stood there and the, uh, held the dial for about 10 or 15 minutes and figured out it was the dispatcher for the Philadelphia Police Department. Well, in those, you know, 1953 in Philadelphia, there's all kinds of murder and mayhem going on on Friday and Saturday night. So this is pretty interesting stuff, you know, just getting all these wild calls for shootings and robberies and all kinds of car wrecks and, and how the police reacted to that. Well, it just it was kind of interesting. Well, I got tired of holding the TV selector dial between channel four and five, so I made sure I could get the signal back, and then I ran out to the kitchen, got some toothpicks, and came back and stuck them in the selector dial. So I guess I hacked my grandparents' TV set. <laughs> so the next night, I got a scrounged a map, of a city map of Philadelphia, and I started plotting were the dresses for the police calls. And then, uh, you know how the police use 10 codes, like 10 4, 10 6, you know. So I, I, I started listening to those, and I, so I got three by five cards, I started tracking those and then figuring out what they meant. It's kind of like metadata, I guess you'd call it now. <laughs> and uh, then I figured out by just listening to the police call, uh, the calls and where they dispatched cruisers, I figured out what the police district boundaries were. And then uh, I figured out, I listened a lot, and that the uh, officer, police officers, a great lieutenant and above, had their own special call signs. And I even figured out the, they compromised the, uh, uh, the call sign for the police chief. You know, and I figured out what was the criterion for getting him out of bed at night. <laughs> so this went on about two and a half, three weeks. Uh, every night, so I'm, you know, sleeping all day and then up all night listening to this. So my dad and mom come back to pick up my sister and me, and uh, my dad, just to make conversations, hey, what have you been doing? And so I whip out my map and my three by five cards, <laughs> and I gave him about a 25 minute di dissertation on how the Philadelphia Police Department is organized and how it operates and all this. And it was 65 years ago, I'll never forget the expression on my dad's face, he said, my God, I raised my own replacement. <laughs> So that's how I knew I was going to be an intelligence officer. Now, I tell the story, happily it was humorous, but it also illustrates a little bit about how you do intelligence work, where you, you're dealing with incomplete information. In this case, the Philadelphia Police Department really wasn't thinking about some 12-year-old kid trying to figure out what they do just by listening to them talk. But that's what we do, particularly in the signal intelligence business. The principles are the same. You develop. Uh, hypotheses, you get more information, you test your hypotheses, and then you, you keep doing that iteratively over and over again. And that's, that's kind of what intelligence work's all about. So, And maybe just one quick uh, note, but I think an important note, something that weighed upon you perhaps at the point and from then on, uh, before you, you uh, finished high school and, and joined the military, at the age of 17, your, your father was based in Nuremberg in Germany. Right. This was only 13 years after the, the, holoc the end of the Holocaust and, and, and you know, that number of years after the Nuremberg trials. Right. I know you went with your family and toured the courtrooms and had a firsthand kind of exposure to the true horrors of extremism. Right. At that point, it was fascism, but I think you, you mentioned in your book that it, it also kind of opened your eyes to the idea of, of the dangers, say, of communism, of one, one government having absolute and con, complete right. control. Right. Could you talk about that? Well, uh, it, it, that's, that, that's all, all true. And I, I do remember, uh, as a senior in high school, um, in a dependent high, military dependent high school in Germany, and uh, in, in Nuremberg, uh, where the uh, war crimes trials were held. And uh, I remember what, uh, big impression that made on, on us kids when we, we saw that and then we studied in the classroom uh, 
what the uh, fascists, uh, the Nazis had done, and of course the Holocaust and all that, I get uh, made uh, quite an impression on me. Uh, I know uh, at a fairly early age, I, you know, I'm 17 years old, and you know, most kids that age are not worried about heavy things like that. But it was right there, and it was a piece of history. And uh, uh, this was, you know, 1958 or 59, so not that long after the war. So yeah, it made a made a great impression on me. And then just uh, I guess to kind of you know begin your your extremely long and dedicated military career. Uh, I know you applied to all of the service academies. Uh, and I flunked, know flunked. I, I could, yeah, couldn't pass physical. <laughs> but but exactly, I was gonna say I know the the final hurdle which you couldn't pass was as your left eye was judged to yeah. be insufficient for getting into the academies. But you didn't give up. You kind of kept trying. Um, you actually ended up, you joined the Marines. A lot of people associate you as an Air Force General, but you started the Marines. Could you talk about that briefly? Well, what happened was that uh, uh, I had, a, my left eye wouldn't correct a 2020. <clears throat> in the day, that was disqualifying. So I'm trying to get in, you know, appointments to the academies and all that, couldn't. So my friend, my dad had a friend in the Marine Corps, and the Marine Corps, uh, a little less uh, demanding about that if you were willing to be a volunteer. So they, they uh, got me through the eye exam. And uh, so I enlisted in the Marine Corps Reserve on the 2nd of February, 1961. And uh, went down to Quantico and uh, went through the uh, platoon leader course. They still, they still run it the same way today. And uh, so I was only in the Marines briefly, about a year and a half, then transferred to the Air Force Reserve. But uh, my family says I, I never got over it. You know. Once a Marine, always a Marine, I guess. But anyway, I ended up, because uh, I wanted to specialize in intelligence and spent 32 years on uh, active duty in the Air Force. And, uh, and, and maybe, you know, I think you've served basically under or, or within every single American administration since JFK. Could you right. just briefly talk about your kind of remarkable, uh, as a very young cadet, meeting of J with JFK? Yeah. So I. Uh, the following summer, I went to our, uh, ROTC, Air Force ROTC summer camp up at uh, Otis Air Force Base, which is near Hyannisport, where the Kennedys had their summer home. And so uh, President Kennedy was coming in, and so they had got all the ROTC cadets who were encamped then, and you know, it was kind of a captured audience, or, if you will. So I ended up uh, in the rope line right in front of the, you know, the first row. So Pre President Kennedy got off the plane and. This was uh, this is August of 1962, and uh, so he's going down the line and he's asking each cadet, uh, you know, what airplane you're going to fly, you know. And he went through about six or seven cadets, and they came to me and he said, "Well, what airplane are you going to fly?" And I said, "I'm not going to fly an airplane, sir. I'm going to I'm going to be an intelligence officer." And uh, he did this double take, you know, "What are you doing here?" sort of thing. And he said, "Well, that's good. We we need we need intelligence officers." And I'm sure he forgot it. I, I never I never forgot it. It was quite an experience meeting him. And in your early career, a lot of people here in the audience would be you know, interested to know, and they could read about it in the book. You you served many many years in Texas, both at yeah. bases based out of San Angelo and also San Antonio. Right. Uh, and then ver very early on in the Vietnam War, you uh, volunteered as to be one of the first in, intel officers to Vietnam. Could you talk briefly about what you did and, and what you were doing? Well, uh, first I'll just say that uh, I went, as you indicated, there pretty early to Vietnam, uh, 19, uh, November 1965. And, and uh, uh, that was when they started uh, sending people for one-year tours. So that, that was uh, the deal. And it turned out to be the, the most miserable year in my life. I, I hated it and, uh, in fact, almost got out of the Air Force after, after it was over. Um, so after been, I'd been there about four or five months, and uh, I was plucked out of an anonymity, uh, you know, hundreds of lieutenants they had there, and uh, was told to, uh, every Saturday I had to go brief just General Westmoreland. And General Westmoreland for many, several years was the commander of uh, Military Assistance Command Vietnam, this four, Army four-star senior officer in charge. I never even uh, seen a four-star general, let alone talked to one. And uh, so this is very intimidating, you know, the first time I did it. And what I was supposed to do was, uh, he, General Westmoreland was big on numbers, uh, which got, actually got to me uh, after a while, because uh, body count, uh, and of course the Air Force, he went all about airstrikes over North Vietnam. 
uh, how many uh, secondary explosions, how many brid bridges that were taken out, how many road cuts, how many convoys, how many trucks were bought, you know, was, he was a numbers fanatic. So we had one, there were two of us. One lieutenant briefed all these numbers and then I went in his uh, inner sanctum office. I had this big board with thought bubbles on it. And if we saw any SIGINT reflections, in other words, if we, we intercepted North Vietnamese talking about U.S. bombing them, he, he kind of ate that up. So I do, I do these thought bubble charts. And, but first three or four Saturdays I did this and I was scared to death. Uh, but after a while I got, I actually kind of disillusioned because I always thought, gee, a four-star general and lots of medals and all that, that this guy knew what he was doing and had a strategy for winning the war and all that. And then I found out, no, he really didn't. He was just there counting stuff. And uh, it was very disillusioning. Uh, and so at the end of the year, I was uh, going to come back to San Antonio at Kelly Air Force Base and uh, finish my master's degree. I was going to uh, St. Mary's uh, University at night and uh, finish that and go to the National Security Agency and do, do cryptograms the rest of my life. And uh, <laughs> once again, you know, fate, uh, a friend of mine called me and he was going to pilot training and he said, uh, would you want to interview for, uh, to be the aide to the commander of the, the old Air Force Security Service, a two-star. So yeah, what's an aide do? Sure, okay, I'll try. I'll, so I, I did the interview, got the job. And that led to a series of uh, people that uh, mentored me. And I always talk to young people about the importance of mentoring, uh, or anybody. Uh, it's, it, it had a huge impact on, on, on my life, and it, it all started quite, quite by accident. And I mean, there's so much to cover, but maybe just to touch upon a few highlights that a lot of people might know or remember from the news. Um, not too many years after that, uh, basically in the end of the 80s, you were basically uh, the commander of all U.S. intelligence in uh, Korea. Um, can you talk about, for any people who may not remember or be familiar with it, the, the, what the time was the Soviet Union shooting down of, of the Korean air flight uh, uh, 007 <coughs> and, and what your role was in that and, and kind of in a bigger, broader sense, what Reagan's role was in that in terms of what he chose to declassify? Yeah. The, um, uh I was actually still, I was in the Pentagon when that occurred. It was 1983 when the uh, Russians, the Soviets shot down uh, KAL-007 uh, airliner. And uh, I had, one of the things when somebody like me writes a book like this, you have to get it cleared from, by the government to make sure that there's nothing in it classified. So I had, we spent about two months uh, arguing with NSA about what I wanted to write about this story, but we finally prevailed. And the reason uh, I wanted to do it is because it is in uh, some contrast with the shootdown of MH17, the Malaysian airliner that the Russians shot down over Ukraine. And, uh, and so there's quite a difference there between 1983 and I think it was, that happened in 2014 or 15. Yet the behavior of the Russians exactly the same. And they tried to avoid any culpability, any responsibility, did all they could to try to blame somebody else. Uh, and they did the same thing in 1983 as they did in, uh, when they shot down the, the Malaysian airliner. And uh, I, I'm not a big fan of the Russians. I, I'll, I'll make, that, uh, make that clear right up front. <laughs> Had a lot of dealings with them over the and, years, and maybe just to move on a few years from, from, yeah, let's from move that, on. that point, you 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 highlight in your book that that you and the intelligence community sees their goal basically not as being there to kind of help uh, establish or, or define policy, but your your job is to inform policy decision makers yeah. and reduce uncertainty and reduce risk. As part of that, um, during the administration of, of George Bush 40, 41, you know, some people consider him the father, uh, someone here in Houston we have uh, fond memories of, um, you were appointed to be the defense intel uh, director of the Defense Intelligence Agencies, and, and then you retired uh, in the mid-90s after, I think, 32 years of military mm -hmm. service. During that time, you moved 23 times, um, and it wasn't just moving across town most of the time. Um, Going on from that, I think to bring it into kind of uh, more recent times, you you went into civilian civilian life, um, but you were called back 
by uh, with when Bush 43 came into the office, yeah. you were brought back in, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to be the new director of what's now called NGA, um, have been called NIMA, uh, the National Geospatial a Agency, the yeah. agency in charge of satellites, imagery, and mapping. And, and uh, you were due to take office on September 13th, I believe. Right. Uh, can you talk about that obviously difficult time? Well, uh, um, Obviously, I was uh, approached about uh, coming back to government, and I—I, you know, I was in an industry, but working for the intelligence community as as a contractor. I taught intelligence at the graduate level, and I was called back to, and became a civilian in the government uh, and did the uh, Cold War Towers investigation, which is when I—I I personally got religion about terrorism. This happened in June of 1996. Uh, it was quite an experience. I had, did some other things back for the government, so then I got a call out of the blue in the summer of 01. Would I come back and head uh, an, an agency which was called the National Imagery and Mapping Agency? And then what this organization, you know, a few thousand employees who mostly civilians, who do um, mapping, charting, and geodesy, and uh, analyze uh, overhead imagery collection for intelligence purposes. And so this agency was put together in 1996, and I was uh, hired on as, uh, brought on as the uh, third director, but the first one, and it was not active duty military. And so everyone in the, all the adults in the room certainly remember exactly where they were when we had the 9-11 attacks. And I was in St. Louis. Um, one third of the agency is in St. Louis, and I was getting briefed up. And uh, I eventually uh, took over uh, about two days, uh, two days later, and did that for uh, almost five years. Uh, I ran afoul of Mr. Rumsfeld, and he let me go early, and I was okay. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, I was and out about uh, three months or so, and uh, uh, Bob Gates, Secretary, of, had become the Secretary of Defense, and. He and I went back to when I served as director of DIA in the early, early 90s, and he uh, called me and asked me if I'd come back, just finish the Bush term as the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence in the Pentagon, overseeing all the defense intelligence stuff. So I said, you know, I'd love to do that, but you could help me out if you call my wife. <laughs> and he did, and then he recounted that incident in his book. <laughs> which was a little embarrassing. <laughs> anyway, it was supposed to be 19 months, and then for, uh, something happened that had never happened in history before, where when President Obama was, was elected as a Democratic president, he asked uh, Gates, who was a Republican, to stay on as Secretary of Defense. That never happened before, so in turn, uh, Gates asked me to stay, so the 19 months turned into three and a half years, and. Uh, and then I, I got summoned one day in 20, April of 2010 up to uh, Gates's office, and he said, you know, we need you to do this uh, DNI thing. I said, uh, no. <laughs> uh, at the time, I was pushing 70 years old. Now I'm dragging it. And uh, <laughs> I did not want to go through another uh, political uh, confirmation, because uh, the first one uh, was awful uh, in, in the finish the Republican administration. But, uh, you know, they run you in the Oval Office, and. Uh, you know, the commander in chief says, hey, I need you to do this job. And I said, okay, you know. <laughs> and that was uh, six and a half years of that. And uh, now I'm I am done. I am, I am, and, I am done. And just uh, maybe to explain a bit bro more broadly, um, a lot of people are familiar with the, you know, the director of the CIA or NSA, the kind of perhaps easier um, positions to understand. Yeah, let me explain. Uh, I'll just, uh, Obama uh, said, I think, shortly after your, your uh, uh, after you were appointed, he told your family, oh, yeah. you know, congratulations, he now has the second worst job in Washington. Yeah. Can, can you explain what exactly your roles were and, and, yeah. and how difficult it was? What that it was, uh, we had to roll out in the Rose Garden, which uh, was a pretty scary experience for me. And so I had my uh, daughter and her family and I, uh, two of my grandkids. And my granddaughter was about 13 or 14 then. And so uh, President Obama was talking to the kids and everything, and he just he told my granddaughter, I want to thank your grandfather for taking on the second most thankless job in this city. <laughs> and boy, he was right. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So. And to, to go back to uh, the Iraq War, 
Uh, yeah, let's go back you, and pick you, that up. <laughs> Big failure. We want to be sure to talk about that. Uh, as the director of the uh, you know, NGA, uh, you mentioned in your book that it was a lot of your uh, geospatial intelligence, your satellite imagery yeah. that was basically used to kind of, with basically building the case against Saddam with regards to weapons of mass destruction and some of what uh, Colin Powell used in his presentation before the UN. Uh, basically, before receiving basically kind of a, the yeah. international approval for the invasion, can you talk about what it is you think happened? Did did a policy start leading intelligence instead of intelligence yeah. informing policy, or where do you see the the failure? Well, first, I mean the the, the general principle that uh, uh, governs the uh, relationship between intelligence and policy. Intelligence is not supposed to make policy. Uh, intelligence supports and feeds it, um, but doesn't uh, do it. And in the end, you know, and why, it sort of begs the question, why do we do intelligence? Why does the United States do intelligence, or why does any nation state do intelligence? And I think in the end, the simple explanation is the purpose is to reduce uncertainty. Eliminate it if you could, but that rarely happens, but at least reduce uncertainty for uh, a decision maker. Well, the decision maker is in the Oval Office, or if I could stretch the metaphor, an Oval Foxhole. It doesn't make any difference. The objective is reduce uncertainty, reduce risk. Um, so the example that we're talking about here was a national intelligence estimate that was rendered in October of uh, 2002. And I remember it very well because my fingerprints are on that NIE. And it was a, ter it was a terrible mistake that the intelligence community made um, and it was used by a very uh, uh, willing uh, administration as a justification for invading Iraq. Uh, and what the uh, NIE said, National Intelligence Assessment, and the NIE is the apex, it's the top ranked intelligence product that the intelligence community produces for the president and other senior policymakers. And uh, it was a combination, and why, why did it happen? Well, it's a combination of groupthink and um, uh, not understanding uh, the veracity of the collection sources that were used to generate that NIE, and it led to a whole bunch of you know, house of cards sort of thing, notably uh, uh, Colin Powell's speech in the UN, which was very compelling, very convincing, uh, uh, the evidence, laying out the evidence we thought we had about uh, the presence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and that was the, uh, you, the excuse that the uh, administration, Bush administration, used to invade. And of course, there are obviously all kinds of implications there uh, uh, in terms of what happened as a result of that invasion, not, not the least of which certainly was a loss of life many people wounded and uh, the billions and billions of dollars that we've spent in, in Iraq. So a key source of um, uh, that, that drove that NIE was called, it was nickname, was, the project name was called Curveball and this was a German human, a, a human intelligence source that, that the Germans had access to but we didn't. And he conjured up, rather convincingly, all kinds of stories about weapons of mass destruction, biological weapons research that the uh, Iraqis were doing. And a lot of the NIA hinged on his reporting. Now, it turns out he was bad. Uh, he was an alcoholic, uh, had all kinds of uh, mental issues and all that. And when we approved that NIA, we didn't know all that. So. And of course, there was a certain amount of groupthink where we didn't allow for uh, dissent. In other words, we didn't, we, we kind of wanted everybody, you know, the common denominator thing, where everybody would get on board so we'd have a unanimous uh, assessment. So I think the lesson here is, uh, I like to say that the intelligence community is a learning organization, and we went to school on that and a built-in safeguards to, to try to prevent that sort of thing from happening. So when I, for example, when I was the Director of National Intelligence, and we have a meeting of what's called the National Intelligence Board, which is all the seniors for the intelligence community to vet and approve an NIE. The first thing we do 
the very first thing we do before we start the discussion is to have each agency, each component that contributed collection and to that NIE has to stand up and attest to the veracity and the credibility of the sources. And if any of the sources turned out to be bad, and they're withdrawn. And each agency director has to certify in writing the veracity of those sources. And we did a lot of other things, you know, we do excursions, what if, what if we're wrong? We do red teaming, uh, you know, man from Mars, look at the, at the evidence. We did a lot of things to try to prevent a recurrence of what was a, a terrible, terrible uh, mistake. And as I say, uh, it was a big deal to me because as an agency director at the time in 2002, I, I had my fingerprints on that. And just very briefly, move on to something else. Do you think Saddam, I know not allowing in inspectors and all that, do you think he was bluffing with regards to basically feeling you need those weapons of mass destruction so perhaps think, the West wouldn't have it or, or even more afraid of Iran? My theory is that he wanted to create the impression, uh, mainly for the Iranians, uh, for their benefit, as, as a deterrent, even though he, he didn't have them. And, you know, we came up at, at the National Imagery Mapping Agency, we came up with what we thought were about 950 suspect sites of weapons of, of potential weapons of mass destruction, and not one of them had any any weapons of mass destruction. So talk about learning a lesson, uh, boy, I sure did, about uh, being skeptical, uh, testing testing the veracity of a collection sources and and, uh, and and the analytic work that's done as a result. Yeah, be careful with that. So maybe move from one of the most challenging times. Well, I will say, <laughs> it, 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 this sounds a little defensive, but intelligence is a classic profession where when I'm right, nobody remembers, and when I'm wrong, nobody forgets. And, uh, you're you're, you're kind of like offensive lineman. Yeah, that, yeah that, sort that of like capacity. that. <laughs> um, to go from one of the most challenging times in recent years for the intelligence community to perhaps one of the highlights uh, for the intelligence community, and perhaps in your career, the raid, uh, basically to take out uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, at that point, you were serving as the Director of National Intelligence for Obama. For any of you who, who know that famous photo from the Situation Room, or it's actually not in the Situation Room, right? It's a, it's a room, breakout room. Yeah. Breakout room beside it. Uh, you're in that photo. Someone took your seat, so you are standing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but can you can There's you an inside about? baseball story here. So <laughs> yeah. There's an iconic picture that was taken of us. Actually, we were in a very, very small breakout room watching uh, the raid uh, go on. And the reason we weren't in the main situation room, which isn't all that much bigger, is because Tom Donnellan, who was then the National Security Advisor, did not want to create the image that the President was reaching out and running this tactical operation, which of course we didn't. So for some reason it was okay to go in this little bitty room next door and watch it. But anyway, uh, so I would have, in the famous picture, I would have been sitting next to the Air Force one-star general that was actually driving the computer so we could watch. And uh, being an older fellow, I had to run out and go to the bathroom. And I lost my seat to uh, Dennis McDonough, who was then the Deputy National Security Advisor, later the Chief of Staff. So. Anyway, I'll, the thing I will never forget about that, I mean, there have been books written about it. There's you know, what's new about it. I'll just give you an impression of mine. It, we were closeted in the, in, the, in the West Wing for 13 hours you know, during the course of the raid. And when we were pretty sure it was UBL, uh, basically a preliminary DNA that confirmed, we were about 95% 90, sure it was him. So the president was going to make a speech just to announce it that, that Sunday night, about 11 o'clock. And I'd been so, everybody had been so focused, so, so intense uh, on this. And I remember, I'll never forget, walking out of the West Wing along the portico by the Rose Garden, and of course had gotten out that what had happened, and there was this huge crowd in Lafayette Park across the street from the White House yelling, USA, USA, USA. And boy, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, a very emotional thing then. Um, because it was closure for the country and certainly closure for the intelligence community uh, when that, when I had, I'll, ne I'll never forget that. And, uh, you know, maybe just briefly to touch upon a point from that, uh, in essence, I suppose there were three options. One was to kind of continue waiting and see if you get a higher degree of certainty. Second was yeah. to use a, a, a drone strike or something similar to kind of take out the entire compound. And the third was obviously that the riskier option is sending the SEAL teams. I know 
uh, not as the as director of national intelligence, because you'd already given your intelligence perspective, but when Obama asked you your personal perspective, yeah. you, you had mentioned that if, if a SEAL team went in, they at least had the reasonable and rational control to stop a raid if they realized it was not correct. Well, uh, we had a meeting. The raid was on. Actually, ended up on. Um, it was delayed a day, because, a night, because of weather in the target area. So the raid actually went down on May second, uh, twenty eleven, Sunday night. Thursday was a, the previous Thursday was the last meeting we had of the small group that actually knew about this because uh, it was very compartmented. And uh, of course, obvious, for obvious reasons, you know, if it leaked and he, you know, we'd, lo we'd lose him. So the president went around um, and asked everybody what their opinion was about should we do it, the raid, and if so, how. And we got all wrapped around the axle on uh, confidence levels. You know, uh, somebody said, well, I'm 40% confident. Now, the issue was, was Osama bin Laden there in the Abbottabad about compound? And we hadn't seen him in a long time. And uh, so we had this big debate about uh, I'm 40% confident, I'm 60% confident, I'm 70%, you know, which is all subjective. And it came around my turn, and I, I, I told President Obama that you ought to ignore all the percentage stuff and pay attention to the analysts that have been following this, following him for literally years. Some of, one of the analysts have been on, been on just tracking UBL for like nine years. And their instinct was he was there. So that's kind of what we went on, even though we weren't, we weren't sure. And then the recommendation, uh, there were three options about how to do it, you know, a, a weapon from a, an RPV or um, blow the whole place away with a, a, a big strike, which you know, would have caused all kinds of collateral damage, or a, a, a raid by special operations forces. And I was in favor of that for the simple reason to have thinking people on the ground who could see the situation and decide what to do. And, um, you know, whatever you think about President Obama, he made a, a really courageous decision, uh, which could have been a disaster uh, in, in lots of ways. But uh, it turned out it was a great success, classic example of intelligence and special operations uh, operating together. Uh, really, uh, it was uh, certainly the, had a, lot, a lot of low lights when I was the director of national intelligence, but that was, that was clearly the highlight. And then moving on to another uh, chapter you cover in the book um, about Benghazi. A lot of people talk about the Benghazi raid. In, in reality, it was just three separate attacks, and it was on two different locations, one on, in essence, what was the consulate, and, one, and that was on a uh, nearby CIA <coughs> facility. Can you talk about Benghazi and why you think is that that became so politicized more so than almost anything yeah. else. So uh, there's a, a chapter in the book that um, uh, devoted to Benghazi in which uh, I tried my best to uh, set the record straight, at least from my standpoint, about what, what happened and, and what didn't happen. And uh, first of all, I think the most important thing was that it, it really wasn't a classic terrorist attack at all. It was more like uh, vandalism and looting and setting fire to things. It didn't have any of the, the classical ter characteristics, no IEDs. Um, they didn't, uh, the, the people that came on the compound didn't even know the ambassador was there. Uh, so it was much more into that. They, the second raid, which was the second attack, there were actually really only two, was a, a CIA, small CIA compound about a mile or a mile and a half away. And that's the only time that there was any military proficiency uh, demonstrated when they, um, the raiders, uh, the terrorists, whoever they, whatever they were, dropped about uh, six mortar rounds uh, on that compound, too, which uh, hit the top of the compound where uh, two of the uh, CIA contract people were, a very, very tragic uh, loss. The, the big question I, I raise there were eight, count them, eight separate congressional investigations of Benghazi, um, which I think, frankly, uh, much more uh, political than people really trying to find the truth. And the one question I never got asked is uh, what, and I, I all due respect to Chris Stevens, who was the ambassador, I, I, I'll never forget meeting with him. Uh, he came by to see me and, and before he went out to Libya to Tripoli, and I remember, the, and this still haunts me today, the last thing I said to him as he's walking out of my office was stay safe. 
And he was an expert on Libya. He'd, he'd been there before and spoke, to, he spoke Arabic. Uh, and, but the question I, I've always wondered about was what was he thinking to go to Benghazi, a known hotbed of extremism, on the anniversary of 9-11 against the backdrop of this uh, terrible video that had been uh, circulating in the Mideast, which was causing all kinds of riots and demonstrations in places like Cairo and that sort of thing. What was on his mind when he, when he did that? And it, it didn't take any, any, uh, any security. Um, ambassadors are in charge. They, they make those decisions. And you know, no one ever uh, raised that question. No, we spent a lot of time uh, finger pointing at, uh, at other people. But uh, anyway, I won't go into all the gory detail. The one thing we did do, which uh, I've, and one thing I failed at here was, we put together a reconstruction of what happened. We used three-dimensional graphics. We embedded um, our, the RPV video, uh, drone video, and, and most tellingly, surveillance camera footage. We put together a complete sequence of what happened in, the, in this attack. And I wanted to declassify this and get it out to the public because it really told the story of exactly what happened and what didn't happen. And uh, couldn't get past, uh, and I apologize if there are attorneys in the audience, but the lawyers were concerned about that because one, it could jeopardize the prosecution if, because they're still tracking down these people that participated in the raid, and that's, that was a major reason. And there were other complications uh, I won't go into here, but it was a frustration of mine. I couldn't get that out to the public. So I tried to, the best I could, because uh, you could see it graphically, and, and try to lay it out in this uh, one chapter in a book. Uh, another you know, major uh, point in your uh, career as DNI was the Iran nuclear deal. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, obviously, you have no illusions about Iran and the regime, that it's a yeah. very repressive and autocratic and dictatorial regime. Um, but you also mentioned the, the concept or the idea that if you have to have a choice between a, a, a terrorist regime with nuclear weapons or a terrorist regime without nuclear weapons, well, you would try and uh, err on that side. Um, first of all, can you talk about how is that deal uh, monitored since that point by uh, the intelligence community? And secondly, you also mentioned that you felt it wasn't a perfect deal, that we should have asked, that we gave away too much or should have expected more. What, what did you mean well, by that? Uh, I mean, like most agreements like this are, you know, are flawed, uh, and this one was, and certainly the, the time limit uh, was uh, bothersome to me, but for me, the essential question was, which would you rather have, a state-sponsored terrorism with a nuclear weapons capability or state-sponsored terrorism without one? And I sort of favored the latter. Um, what I wish uh, this administration had done is use that agreement as a building block and leverage to get after some of the, the you know, there's other nefarious behavior that uh, Iranians are famous for, you know, support to the Houthis in Yemen, the support to Hezbollah, and some of the other bad stuff, they, and, and their involvement in Syria. Um, but by not, by back, backing out of that agreement, and, and we're kind of all by ourselves, and the president s said he wants to do it in favor of a better deal. A better deal, meaning that they want a, a full, re they want to reform all of the, uh, Iran's bad, bad behavior. But yet we're going to do it with a whole lot less leverage than we had to do just one piece, which was the nuclear piece. Because if we try to, you know, to make Iran the uh, shining city on the hill or something, there, there was no way we'd get any, anywhere with that. So we thought the administration thought the most, the most worrisome problem, most worrisome threat was the nuclear weapons capability. And that's what we uh, tried to uh, mitigate, which which they did. The Iranians abided by and still are in, in compliance, and they got rid of uh, all kinds of uh, uh, highly enriched uranium. They cemented up their uh, uh, water production plant, which you need for uh, heavy water plant, heavy water production, for, which you need for plutonium. They submitted to unprecedented surveillance by the International Atomic Energy Administration. You know, they have surveillance cameras, sensor systems, all kinds of stuff. And the Iranians submitted to that. And we're sort of walking away from that, uh, and with a whole lot less leverage, because all the, co the countries that came together imposed sanctions on Iran, which brought them to the table, they're not going to join us. The European countries, they're, they're good with the deal. So to me, we just uh, we sort of lost leverage. I, I failed to see how, um, and believe me, I had a, 
a uh, very unpleasant hour and a half with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu about this in 2015, uh, but I fail to see how this not having it somehow enhances the security of Israel, which is, is a big deal to the United States and a big deal to me personally. Um, anyway, I try not to be political here. So. Okay. And just to uh, move on to two other uh, kind of uh, notable events and I guess notable people, uh, one, I guess, is the idea of the institution of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, but then uh, also with regards to specific individuals. Um, could you talk about the, uh, what it was with, say, Chelsea Manning and with regards to the, the, the leaks regarding uh, U.S. intelligence and footage they had? And then, of course, um, you know, Eric Snowden. And perhaps could you also talk about the fact that both Manning and Snowden were perhaps lower and or perhaps mid-level uh, Feel, people within their field, but how is it that they were able to access so much information? I mean, each of them gave not just hundreds or thousands of documents, but hundreds of thousands of documents and perhaps even more. Well, uh, that's, a, that's a, a direct function of the uh, uh, ubiquitous availability of information. And, uh, and uh, you know, the intelligence community is, is no different from that. Uh, than, than what, we're all, what we all experience. We're all inundated with lots and lots of information. We have lots and lots of sources of information uh, to draw on. And so they, they had access. Uh, and both um, Chelsea, now Chelsea Manning and, and then uh, Edward Snowden, um, uh, you know, one man's leaker is another man's whistleblower. That's an endless argument. Um, but did, uh, especially uh, Edward Snowden, did, had done grave damage to uh, our intelligence capabilities, uh, le less so with, with Manning. Uh, as a result of that, the intelligence community has instituted an insider threat detection program where, you know, we're constantly monitoring the electronic behavior of employees, and now we're going to go to a system of continuous evaluation where employees are going to be monitored on their off-duty behavior as well. Um, I worry about that, frankly, because uh, I have a grandson in the business. I have my grandson, uh, oldest grandson, works at CIA. He's a millennial, needs lots of feedback. And <laughs> we, have, we have a lot of conversations about, uh, hey, this place is getting to be too much big brother. I don't want to work here. And I do worry about the impacts of, as a result of these two, these two serious uh, leaks, um, breaches of hemorrhaging of information, but particularly by uh, Edward Snowden. And if you're paying taxes, by the way, uh, we're all paying to recover from what the damage that Edward Snowden did. If what he had done was just limited to uh, so-called domestic surveillance, I could almost understand it. But he, he exposed so much else that had absolutely nothing to do with so-called domestic surveillance that have uh, profoundly damaged uh, our capabilities, notably against terrorists, because the terrorists went to school on the revelations that were published about uh, things that you know, he turned out. And just to, I guess, further build upon that, you're talking about names of individuals that were exposed, methods of, of how surveillance was done, like you mentioned. Well, let me get, I'll give you one specific yeah. example, which uh, I, on the spot, declassified in Congress which I was told about when I got back to the office, but uh, now that it's out, I'll share it with you. We had a, pro a program with the government of Afghanistan, uh, it's called Lawful Intercept, and that means that the uh, government of Af Afghanistan collected all the cell phone calls, or could intercept a cell phone call, any cell phone call in, Af in Afghanistan, and we had a deal, sort of surreptitious, we shared that information, or they shared it with us. The day after Glenn Greenwald published an article about this, uh, President Karzai stopped the program. That was the single most important source of warning for IED attacks. And Edward Snowden exposed that. That's just one example. We had commercial encryption, which we had projected out by seven years, accelerated by instantly. So now we're in a mode where there are uh, encryption apps that everybody can get, you know, WhatsApp and Viber and all that. And we can't break that. And that, that is not a good place uh, to be. That's a whole other uh, argument about uh, the FBI's concern about going dark um, and the difficulty they have with uh, reading cell phones that are implicated in uh, felony prosecutions. And just 
you know, there's so much to cover and for the sake of time, we're gonna move on to you know, just a few more questions and my colleagues will collect those blue question cards. Um, <clears throat> moving on to a big part of this book and, and really, you mentioned in the book that you thought as a DNI you would never write a book. It was never something you intended to do. That's right. But probably the biggest driving force, I think you say, is to, and it's not a political issue, Democrat or Republican, but to make the American public in general aware <laughs> of the degree and also the intensity and breadth of Russian yeah. attempts to influence our, our elections. Can you talk about that and you know, maybe going back to what you think about Putin in the, the 2011 ele elections where uh, you know, yeah. Putin believed that you know, Hillary Clinton came out and publicly chastised him about the elections not being fair and then in some ways it was perhaps maybe as much a personal regard with him thinking uh, Hillary Clinton would be a, a, a bad adversary to have if she's elected regardless of who the, the Republican uh, candidate might have been, unless it was perhaps somebody like you know, um, uh, Marco Rubio. Can you talk about that and how it, it wasn't really a, a political or partisan issue, but how it got there? Well, um, I've had a lot of uh, experience with, with the Soviets and the Russians, and uh, of course I was a Cold War warrior and all that. And the Russians have long uh, interfered in, in elections, theirs and other people's. And we have records going back to at least the 60s where the Russians tried to involve themselves in our elections uh, using money and, and this kind of thing, uh, but never with uh, you know, great impact. Um, and I, over my 50 plus years in Intel, I've seen a lot of bad stuff, but uh, I don't recall being as uh, disturbed as I was when I began to understand, when we all began to understand in the summer of 16 into the fall, the magnitude of what the Russians were doing to interfere, to meddle in our election and influence it. And I believe they did influence the outcome because of the magnitude, the massive effort that they made to influence uh, our election. We uh, published on the 6th of January of 2017 a intelligence community assessment I say we, it was uh, FBI, uh, uh, the National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, and my office. And we went up to uh, Trump Tower on the 6th of January, uh, my first and I'm sure last sojourn to Trump Tower, and uh, briefed the president-elect, which actually went, went, went pretty well. And the, the evidence of the Russian interference was overwhelming. We also published that same afternoon an unclassified version. It's, President Obama directed us to do, to get as much of it out as we could to the public. The findings in that unclassified version, the wording of the findings is exactly the same as was in the highly classified version. The only difference, of course, which is a frustration to some people, is we could not provide the substantiation, the evidence we had, because it involved very sensitive sources and methods and accesses that we obviously didn't want to give away. But the fact that what the Russians did was first, what they wanted to do was simply sow doubt, discord, and discontent in this country, and they succeeded to a fairly well. They had messages for everybody to exploit the polarization in this country, and unfortunately, we're a ripe target. So they had messages for Black Lives Matter. They had messages for white supremacists. They had messages for pro-Muslim, pro anti-Muslim, pro-Israel, anti-Israel, didn't matter, because all they were trying to do was sow discord. And secondly, very strong personal animus that Putin had, and we saw this in the intelligence, Putin had for Hillary Clinton. He held her responsible for, for example, uh, fomenting a color revolution in 2011 to try to un un unseat him, overturn him. And he had ge generally felt that the Clintons, bo both of them, had dissed him uh, over the years. So he had very strong personal animus towards Clinton. Then as the things wore on and uh, Mr. Trump became serious, you know, he, and particularly when he became a nominee, Russians decided that that would be a much better uh, president for them because he would be, because he's a businessman, deal maker, uh, been to Russia, tried to do business there, and most importantly, wouldn't beat, beat up the Russians about human rights abuses. And so they went all out to try to support uh, President Trump. So uh, watching this um, really disturbed me uh, because this gets at, uh, to me, fundamental underpinning of this country, uh, election, messing with our uh, election. And so, yeah, I wasn't gonna write a book. Um, you know, there's a lot of 
antibodies about people writing tell-all books and all that sort of thing. I was, I was just going to fade off stage. But that, that was a catalyst that changed my mind and I uh, decided to do what I could do to try to educate people um, as much as possible in, in this country about uh, the profound threat that Russia poses. And by the way, something we don't pay a lot of attention to is, in addition to the information operations campaign, if you want to call it that, that the Russians continue to mount against us, they're also mounting a very aggressive and disturbing modernization of their strategic nuclear arsenal. You may recall a speech that uh, Putin gave on the 1st of March, and he outlined had graphics, bombing Mar-a-Lago and all that sort of thing, and these weapons of vengeance that are, and they do all that with only one adversary in mind. That's us, the United States. So, uh, you know, there shouldn't be any illusions about the Russians. And I'm going to just maybe two quick questions and I'll get to the audience's questions just to follow up with two things that are obviously both in the news uh, an awful lot uh, with regards to collusion. I mean, you said obviously you don't have access to yeah. any, any no longer to the intelligence community or any classified information, but at least at the time when you left office last year in January, uh, you did not see any smoking gun with regards to collusion, but you said that for you that was not the crucial or vital issue, that what was more important is that collectively, that traditionally both Democrats and Republicans would come together to challenge a threat of something like Russia. Yeah. And, that, and that the idea um, that what was most upsetting to you was that the president himself did not seem to take the threat seriously. Well, that was, that happened, I mean, that started uh, when we briefed, briefed him on, the, on January 6th of 2017. Um, I mean, he just, and he's been very consistent about this. Uh, he had great difficulty accepting what we were presenting to him because in his mind it cast doubt on, on the credibility or the, or the legitimacy of, 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 of the election. And uh, as a consequence, uh, I, I find, uh, you know, his sort of aggressive indifference to the threat posed by Russia is, is uh, bothersome. And uh, I don't know why, I, I, you know, there's all kinds of speculation on why that's so. Um, but I just think as a commander in chief, um, in, in the face of this serious threat that posed by Russia, um, there needs to be, uh, I think, a clear articulation from him as the commander in chief of um, what we're facing. And in the absence of that, there won't be a sense of urgency uh, we want, that's needed to galvanize not only the government but the public about about this. So that was the book. My small attempt to to try to alert people as what I believe is a, a serious threat, and that to me is far more important than whether or not there was collusion or not. Uh, be, I think the country needs that resolved one way or the other. I think the only hope is Bob Mueller, uh, whom I served with uh, when he was director of the FBI. And, uh, and regardless of the outcome, the, the country needs resolution on that, on that issue. It, it's, it's hanging over us like a cloud. But that, having said that, is to me is secondary to the bigger issue, which is the Russians. And just another thing that's been in the, the news, especially over the last few days, this idea, this concept of a, perhaps an informant working with the FBI. Uh, with regards to the, the Trump's campaign. Yeah. Uh, he was making contact with people that the intelligence <coughs> community was concerned that those people had connections with regards to Russians or Russian operatives. Uh, I believe today or yesterday, the Republican chairman of the uh, uh, House Oversight Committee, Trey Gowdy uh, from South Carolina, said that this is basically the FBI following standard procedure. Yeah. How do you address that issue? And, and as, But it's also become very politicized. Well, of course, everything becomes politicized these days. Um, I mean, uh, to me, the, the FBI was doing its job. Um, it was using the, the most benign form of intelligence gathering, a, uh, uh, an informant. They, uh, the FBI uses informants a lot, and they get very valuable information from informants, many of whom have worked for the FBI for, for years. And unfortunately, this one has been identified, which, of course, have a chilling effect on, on informants who are already working for the FBI, let alone uh, the impact it will have on recruiting others. So all this, I mean, 
to characterize this as a spy is really a stretch. Uh, that's a term I don't like anyway, spy, but let's use it for the sake of discussion. Spying means a, a trained clandestine case officer who's been trained in how to do this, who is hiding his identity, his or her identity, and who's trying to recruit somebody and is using clandestine tradecraft. None of that was involved. This is a very benign form of information gathering, uh, someone who could openly inquire. And so this is a, a form of, 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 of elicitation and, and information gathering that's, that's uh, perfectly legitimate. And it seems to me that anyone would be concerned about the Russians attempting to infiltrate a political campaign, which is what they were, you know, what they were doing. And it, that's the FBI's job, from a counterintelligence standpoint, to, to, to determine if, if that's true and what are the Russians attempting to do. Are they trying to gain influence, access, co-op somebody? And so to me, it's uh, perfectly legitimate. It was not uh, a collection effort against the campaign, per se, and certainly not against uh, Mr. Trump personally. This, this was about the Russians and what they were trying to do. And of course, like everything else these days, it's turned into politics. Well, sadly. Um, and, and but uh, to, to Trey Gowdy's great credit as a Republican, even though he's retiring from the Congress, I mean, he made that point. And he'd been, he was briefed on, on exactly what happened. And he said, you know, this is what you know, my fellow citizens would want the FBI to do. I have a lot of uh, excellent questions, and I'm going to give them all to Director Clapper afterwards. We probably I think just have time for two more because I won't have time uh, well, for him to do the book well, signing. I'm on a roll here. You know? <laughs> the, yeah. the book signing afterwards. Um, when it comes to North Korea, again, another major, major intelligence uh, uh, issue in the news, someplace you have an awful lot of uh, experience with. You've actually been to North Korea twice. You actually helped negotiate the release of two uh, Americans, uh, Kenneth Bay and uh, yeah. Kenneth uh, Miller, and brought them back to the United States. Um, where do you see that going? I think I know you said you, you, you thought that it was the right idea to try to negotiate. Um, you, maybe the, the manner in which it's been done is not right, but what do you see with regards to North Korea? Well, first of all, uh, uh, I agree with, uh, I'm, I'm always looking for things I can be supportive of President Trump. And I actually agreed with the letter he sent to Kim Jong-un. Uh, and it got the desired effect. I mean, obviously we, we now have a very unconventional president and, and North Korea is a very unconventional place. Everything you've ever read about how bizarre North Korea is, it's all true. Uh, so I went there in November 2014 and uh, had uh, engagement with uh, two senior Koreans, one of, them, one of whom, uh, Kim, I gotta get the name right here, Kim Jong-chol, who now is in New York. Uh, and uh, who was, <laughs> at the time he was head of the Reconnaissance General Bureau, which is their combination of special operations forces and um, uh, intelligence. And he touted himself as my counterpart when I went there. And it, it, it was a, very, we had a, this very nice dinner, Korean dinner, 13 courses, and it was one of the nastiest conversations I've ever had in my life. This guy was terrible. And so I, I thought it ironic they picked him to be the interlocutor with uh, Secretary of State Pompeo. Was, he was awful. I mean, just hates the United States, hates Americans. Oh, it was it was an awful conversation I had with him. But he's in a new role, and he is he is a trusted confidant of uh, Kim Jong Un. So what? If we have the, if they have the summit, what 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 should be the expectation? What 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 might be done at the uh, to do something productive in a summit. Well, I think what they first ought to think about, not some grand deal, grand bargain on denuclearizing. By the way, when I went there, and my, the, first White, the first talking point the White House gave me to recite to the North Koreans was, you must denuclearize. Well, that was a non-starter. <laughs> they weren't about to do that, when to talk about that. Uh, and they specifically cited uh, Muammar Gaddafi, you know, the Libyan guy that uh, negotiated away the weapon. His weapon was a mass destruction, and it didn't turn out so well for him. Well, they, they went to school on that. So for them, uh, nuclear weapons is their ticket to survival. 
uh, they know they are uh, over overmatched. Um, when, they, when you're sitting in Pyongyang looking south, you see an overwhelming military force just by the Republic of Korea, the South Koreans, buttressed by us. And they know that nobody would pay attention to North Korea if they didn't have those nuclear weapons. They know that. They are rational, by the way. They are very rational. So what I've been long an advocate of is the first thing you ought to talk about is how to normalize the communications apparatus between the two countries. And so I've, you know, I pushed this in the Obama administration and fell on deaf ears there too, was to establish interests, what were called interest sections, one in Pyongyang, one in Washington. Interest sections are a level be way below an ambassador, but a diplomatic presence, which we had in Havana, Cuba for decades to deal with a government we never recognized in Havana. The same thing here. Why do that? Not as a reward for bad behavior, and goodness knows they're, they're bad, but from really practical, pragmatic reasons why that's in our interest to do that. One, to have a diplomatic presence there, a full time. I could argue, I can't prove it, I could argue that things might have been different for poor Otto Wambier, the University of Virginia student, had we had somebody there, a diplomat, recognized diplomat, who could bug the hell out of the North Koreans about his, his health and welfare. Secondly, for intelligence purposes. One of the reasons North Korea is such a hard target for us is we're not there. If we were there, we could do a lot. Enough said on that. Third, to have a, as a conduit inf information into North Korea, which is a big deal. And uh, we need to uh, try to let the North Koreans know what the rest of the world is like, because they don't know. They're very isolated. And fourth, this would give actually a degree of security. This sounds strange, but it, this would give a degree of security to the North Koreans, knowing that the US has a facility there so we won't bomb them, because they worry, they worry themselves to death about uh, they're gonna, we're going to bomb them. I could not get over the siege mentality and the paranoia that exists in Pyongyang among the uh, elite, one of whom is this character that's now in New York. The other thing is, I actually didn't find their uh, desire for a peace treaty to be unreasonable, because you know, all we have there is a ceasefire. Everybody stopped shooting on the 27th of July, 1953. And again, from their standpoint, what they see looking south is a big military force poised on a hair trigger ready to invade them and overturn the regime. So I think if they just did that, um, now what's, what, you know, what do you expect from them? Well, North Koreans, I think, are going to, I think the reason for their change is they have achieved whatever they think they needed to achieve in the way of a nuclear deterrent. Now, they wouldn't test, they don't test things the way we do. We wouldn't, we'd test and validate a nuclear weapon. But they, I think, have achieved some degree of confidence in their nuclear capability, whatever it is. So now they feel like they can come to the, con to the negotiating table and they won't be supplicants or inferiors to us like it's always been in the past. They now will feel more co-equal. So I think that's, that's a major reason for the, for the change in their behavior. The big thing is everybody should lower expectations about a summit. And there's not going to be any grand bargain struck about, uh, uh, you know, because the administration demands they denuclearize. Oh, sure, we'll do that. Yes, sir, yes, sir, few days full. I don't think so. Not after they've invested so much uh, time and treasure and energy in, into developing uh, nuclear capability. But I do think uh, this is much better. We're in a much better place now than the uh, threats of war and exchanging nuclear weapons and all that. And the fact that the North Koreans have suspended underground testing, suspended missile tests, and they gave up the three uh, citizens, uh, that, that's all a good sign. We ought to bank on that. The real hero in all this, in my view, is President Moon of South Korea, who, in my view, is maybe the most astute president of the Republic of Korea in its history. And he has really managed his portfolios, the one in Pyongyang and the one in Washington, to bring to this point. And I think whatever the North and South does uh, is a good thing, and it's not a threat to us. 
Okay. Sorry, I, I talked too long. That was great. I mean, honestly, we could go for hours. Um, maybe just in conclusion and summary, uh, someone had asked, what do you see as the most immediate uh, kind of short-term threat to the United States, and what is the biggest long-term geopolitical threat? Right. Or perhaps could they be the same country? Uh, and then also, kind of, do you have any kind of closing remarks or things you'd like us to take away from this in your book? Well, uh, short-term threat is Russia. Uh, and for at least six years, because we're going to have another at least another six years of Putin. And uh, you know has very strong animus towards this country and what we stand for. So they are the big threat for the next six years. Long term, I worry about China. Tremendous economic power and their scientific and technical uh, capabilities and their military modernization program, which is very, very impressive. So those two, and then long and the short of it, those two. And then kind of in regards, kind of, I think despite what, what it might seem like here, your book does have a kind of a, a positive and kind of optimistic yeah. end to it. That you, well, as you, know, you went through one of the hardest times we, of the American yeah, Republic in Vietnam, and we got through it, and we think we're better from it. Do you think that's where we are now? Well, the only uh, argument I had with my collaborator, Trey Brown, who's great, I'd never done a book without him. He was my speechwriter for the last three years I was DNI. And, uh, the only argument we had in the whole book was the last three pages. So we wrote a very dark you know, projection. Then we wrote a happy face version. We didn't like either one of those. But we simply ended by saying uh, the United States has gone through traumas before, notably uh, the Civil War and the trauma. I lived through Vietnam, my war. And we emerged uh, ultimately uh, the better and the stronger for it without making any prognostications uh, here. One point I, I, I hope, I, one theme I hope to make is, uh, at least for me, intelligence is a noble profession. And I hope that I get uh, you know, young people to read uh, the book and, and hope, hopefully interest them in, in public service and, and of course, specifically um, intelligence, which I think is vital to this country and keeps, keeps us uh, safe and secure. So why don't we stop there and just, uh, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. service, Ronan, thank you very much. Um, intelligence is important, and that's why we have the World Affairs Council, so you can be more informed. Stay on our website, wachouston.org. Thank you to Brass's Bookstore, to the Bayou Place. I hope you enjoyed, Director, this afternoon. And he is going to be signing books. There will be a line. Uh, he is only going to be able to really sign books and answer a lot of individual questions. So go ahead and get in line, and thank you again. We look forward to seeing all of you in the fall. Have a great summer. <laughs>